Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just want to mention, I missed you guys last week, uh, and I appreciate Jeff stepping up. That was, it was a nice thing to do. And if you see a, a red motorcycle going down the road, it saves me 10 bucks a trip to Dupree, I figured. <laughs> compared to my truck, and my truck still doesn't have air conditioning, so there we go. Um, today I want to talk about something that might be a little confusing. Uh, it, it's kind of a questionable thing sometimes in the Bible when we, when we read this passage out of Matthew here, when Jesus talks about serpents and doves. But I think today, as much as any other time in history, I think today that's important that we look at this and understand what Jesus was saying here. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to get together in fellowship and in worship, Lord, to praise your name and to study your word. I pray, Lord, that you give me the words that you want spoken as we go forward here and that our hearts and our ears are open to these things. I ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go right into to Matthew 10 here. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's a kind of an interesting contrast there, the simile that he puts in here. He actually has two where he talks about having these qualities that animals have. Animal similes. We all know these things. As strong as an, an ox, as proud as a peacock, peacock as wise as a owl, owl as quiet as a mouse. <laughs> another one in the dining room that kept that for us this morning. Ooh. As slippery as an eel. eel. As happy as a clam. Bark. Lark? I was going to say lark. Bird, yeah, yep. Lark. As sly as a fox. As busy as a bee. beaver or bee. As slow as a snail. snail. Oh. So I was thinking snail. As brave as a rabbit. Lion. <laughs> brave as a lion. There you go. As fat as a cat? No. Pig. Pig, oh. As free as a bird. bird. As stubborn as a Shannon. <laughs> as sick as a dog. Oh yeah. My daughter would have said this morning she was sick as a dog. She's having a really rough morning. So. Yeah, I called her and she was throwing up when I, she answered. So we have all these all these similes we talk about with animals, and we're talking about individual qualities of those animals. We're not talking about everything in that animal. Uh, when we're talking about individual qualities, and that's what Jesus used those similes for. First one, wolves and lambs. He said, I'm sending you out as lambs into the world, and the world is equated to wolves. The wolves are intentionally hostile. They don't stop and discuss it with the lamb first. They just attack. They don't worry about what the lamb feels about it. They don't hide it. They don't even disguise the fact that they're wolves. And the world is like that. The world has a lot of people like that that we're going to run into that are intentionally hostile from the very beginning. Before you say a word, they're going to be hostile towards you as a Christian. Good. You forgot a line. Yeah. Predators. Yep. The world, that's the way the world is. And we're told, of course, not to be like the world, so as Christians, we can't be this way. We can't be attacking people. You're not going to get anybody to, to come to the kingdom by attacking them. But that lamb and wolf thing is one. The other one is the serpents and the doves. Now, I apologize. I, when I taught at the academy, there was a PowerPoint we had. And it was a full picture of a snake. And I literally had people that were training to be police officers run out of the room at the picture of a snake. That, that afraid of snakes. But we look at snakes and we think... Wait a minute. We're supposed to be like a serpent? What do we know about serpents from the Bible? What's the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about a snake? Satan. Yeah, well, Gen Genesis 3.1. Go ahead. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And then immediately we go into Satan talking to Eve, right? That's what we think about with serpents. But Jesus is not equating any of this, this Eden-like qualities to, to, ask, to ask us to be like Satan. But what he is saying is to be crafty like a snake. And snakes are special in some very odd ways. One of my oldest, my oldest son is 
really into reptiles. He really likes them. He's always had snakes, which is just weird in my opinion, but hey, I don't know where he got it. But we have a lot of snakes around here. I know we have a lot of snakes on our place. I have not seen them. If they don't want to be seen, they're not seen. If you corner them, they're going to attack. But if you, they don't want to be seen, you won't see them. They hide out, especially if something's coming. They, they prefer to run from a threat than attack. However, if necessary, they fight back. And I think that's more of what Jesus was talking here, is having the wisdom to know when to stay and when to go. Doves, the dove equation here, we, if we go to Luke 3, 2, says, And the Holy, Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Well, it's easy to see. Okay, we equate doves with the Holy Spirit. We also equate doves with Noah. When he sent, sent the birds out to find out if there was dry land, the doves are the one that came back. We go to Leviticus, and doves are one of the clean animals that God talks about, and they're used as sacrifices. If you're not wealthy enough to buy a lamb, bring doves. Doves are, are sacrificial animals. And part of that is because of their innocence. Again, kind of like the lamb. So we see these two different sides here. And the, the dove part's easy. That's easy to understand. The serpent might be a little tougher. So let's talk about what Jesus himself did. Jesus himself, we look at the dove part as a description of Jesus. Well, that's easy to do, isn't it? It's easy to see the harmless, blameless, beautiful little bird there. Matthew 12, 20, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. It's actually a quote originally from Isaiah. So when we look at this, it says, this was Jesus. Nothing. He was not offensive. <laughs> there were times when he needed to be, but for the most part, this is who he was. Matthew 14, 14 says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. This was Jesus. This was the dove side of Jesus. This was the side of Jesus where he felt compassion for people and he dealt with them whether they <coughs> deserved it or not, whether they needed it or not. Healing the lepers that never came back and said thank you. That kind of stuff was Jesus. That's the dove side of Jesus. Matthew 15, 32, then Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. This is comes to feeding the 5,000. Jesus was compassionate. He loved. He loved everyone whether they followed him or not. He loved everyone whether they knew they needed him or not. So when he says, be as wise as serpent and as gentle as doves, that's an easy one for us to understand. There's no way you can witness to somebody without being gentle. You can't go to someone and say, you're a sinner and going to hell, and leave it at that. We're all sinners. That's the gentle side of that approach. We are all sin sinners. Each and every one of us. Without Christ, there's, there's no salvation for anyone. So I'm no different than anyone else. Except that I've found salvation. I have found Christ and accepted him into my life. But that's available for everyone. And that kind of gentleness is not weakness. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, I think. When he says, be gentle as doves, he's not saying be gullible. Gentleness can be a strength and not a weakness if it's used correctly. A gentle word will go a long way in a conversation. Gentleness is a good thing, but it doesn't mean be a doormat. Jesus never says, I want you to go out there and just flop on the ground and let people walk all over you. In reality, he said just the opposite to his disciples. Now, Jesus was also innocent as a dove. Okay? John 8, 46 and 47 says, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason why you do not hear them is you are not of God. He's talking to the Pharisees here who are accusing him of all sorts of heresy. And he says, wait a minute. What did I do wrong? Tell me where I sinned. And they can't. They can't find sin in Christ's life. So no matter whether they agree with what he's saying or not, his innocence shines through. And we're called to do the same. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Even uh, with Pilate, John 18, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. There was nothing to convict Christ for the crucifixion. There was nothing there. In Luke 4, I didn't put this one up there. In Luke 4, Jesus is, is speaking in Nazareth. He's in the temple and he reads from Isaiah. And he tells them, it's, it's, this is it, it's time. And they say, well, wait a minute, you're Joseph's boy. You've lived here all your life. And eventually they get mad enough at him, they try and kill him. And throw him off a cliff. And he, it says he snuck through the, he went through the crowd. He passed through the crowd and disappeared. There were times when Jesus walked away and said, this is not a good place to be. And he just left. And there time, the time came, in the fullness of time, though, when the crucifixion was there and he knew it was necessary, and he walked towards it. That's the wisdom that we're talking about, the, the, the wisdom of Christ here as well. The wolves were constantly coming after Jesus, weren't they? And the biggest wolves in his world were the Pharisees. They really wanted to stop him. Mark 8, 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. He was always being tested. Have you ever had that happen in your life when you're talking about Christianity and the first thing they say is Christians are all hypocrites? The first thing they want to do is try and knock something off, knock something down. What about testing? How can God do this if he's a loving God? You hear that all the time. These kind of things, these kind of challenges are going to come, and Jesus wasn't any different. He had them too. Mark 2, 10, 2 said, the Pharisees came up in order to test him and said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Mark 12, and they sent him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. They asked Jesus, you know, they came to him about the money, and Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar, and give to God what's God's. Jesus did, was not going to fall for any of these traps. He was wise enough not to fall for the traps, and he expected them. And as we go through the gospel, when we first start out in the gospel, Jesus talks to the Pharisees and tries to share the word with them. And they're constantly fighting to the point where he says, you brood of vipers. They're like a whitewashed tomb. Pretty on the outside and dead on the inside. And he stops. From then on, he doesn't try and argue with the Pharisees because they're not listening. They don't hear the message. They're condemning him for healing people. Think about that. Someone is miraculously healed right in front of you, and the first thing they say is, you shouldn't do that on Sabbath. Wait a minute. He just, he just healed someone, and you're saying that was wrong? How can you even look at it from that direction? They were not listening. They were wolves. And they were wolves on the, on the aggressive side that were attacking, and they were not going to listen. So Jesus responded with wisdom. His response to the wolves was wisdom. His disciples came to him, Matthew 13. The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak in parables? I preached a lot of those parables. Why did Jesus speak in parables? He said, why? They said, why aren't you just saying it out in words? Why do you tell us in parables, these things, these stories? He answered them, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That's why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words, he's talking in parables because he wants those with faith to understand. And it's easy for us to do that. We look at the parable of the sower, and we can see exactly what he's talking about. If you have faith, it makes sense. If you don't, it doesn't. So he said, I'm going to speak to them in languages that if you need to understand it, and you're the one who's supposed to hear it, you will hear it. And if not, it'll sound like garbage to you. It'll sound like gobbledygook. You won't get it. Jesus was saying, I am going to talk to the ones that listen. To the ones that want to hear my voice, they will hear it. And those that don't want to hear my voice won't hear anything at all. Now, this was not the Messiah that the Pharisees wanted. They wanted a warrior Messiah that stood up and confronted Rome. They wanted someone that came up there and shouted and screamed. And 
one of the reasons they didn't like him is because that's not who he was. He didn't fulfill, fulfill the role they wanted him to have. And Jesus said, they're not listening to what I'm saying. But you are. Speaking to his disciples, he said, you understand. You know what I'm talking about. That's why I speak this way. So, application here. Okay, so we've got Jesus saying, be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. How does that apply to us now? We saw Jesus' example, but how does it apply in our own lives? Well, going back to Matthew 10, 1, this is, remember, this is 10, 16, where we're at. In 10, 1, it says, he called, his disciples, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. He's not just sending them out. He's sending them out with his power to do the things he was doing. He sends these 12 disciples out to go out and experience the ministry that is going to be necessary after he dies. This is while he's still alive. This is before the crucifixion. He sends them out. And when he sends them out, he sends them out with his power. Now in doing so, of course, just like with Jesus, you're going to have some people that confront him and don't like that. You're also going to have people that are one to the word because of that. They're, they're one to Christ because of the healing. Just like in Jesus' own life. He shared this with his followers, and he shared that with us as well. Jesus said, you will do greater things than I have done. Because he gives us that power. And that power is a threat to the world. But he did not send them out and say, conquer everything. I want you to go out there and conquer the world. No. He said, I want you to go out and teach. Like he did. We shouldn't, we shouldn't look at our ministry as being what the Pharisees wanted from Christ in the beginning. They wanted some conquering warrior. That's not a Christian's role. We are not to be, we're not to be thinking of things as being a conquering. Instead, we're teaching, we're sharing. We're sharing the love of God. Oh, there it is. Matthew 10, 7 through 14. Now, this is right before this passage about the doves and the servants. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without pain. Give without pain. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. <coughs> no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that town or that house or town. So he's talking to his disciples here and he's saying, I'm giving you all this power, now go do it. But when you're there, this is the serpent part of this. This is the wise part of this. This is the discernment. He says, when you are there, if they don't receive you, walk away. This is not the time or the place. Apparently, they're not paying attention. When you go into, when you go to a place, don't go all prepared and have all your stuff together and go rent the biggest hotel and have a convention center and set it all up. No, he said, go to town, find someone worthy, and go to their house. Be personal. Be gentle. Be innocent. Be exactly the way I was. Go and do it the way I did it. That's the way that Jesus explained this. And he also said. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, if someone is not even going to bother to listen, then stop talking. Walk away. Shake the dust off your feet and then done and move on to the next one. Go to the next place. He even talks uh, later on, I didn't put it up here, but he says flee from them. If it's a, if it's a situation where nobody's even going to bother to try and listen, just leave. Because there's another place you can go that will, they will listen. Find those places. We don't have all the time in the world to get this job done. So instead of staying in there, banging your head against the door, or the wall, go to the door and go through it. There are people that will listen. There are people that need to be healed. There are people that will receive it. And yes, the wolves need Jesus too. The wolves of the world need Christ just as much as anyone else. However, Jesus says, don't walk up to a wolf and stick your head in their mouth. What do you expect to happen? 
This is that discernment again. And that's something I think we need to be very aware of, especially in this day and age. If we look at what's going on in the world right now, I think we need discernment right now. There are places where no one's going to listen to us. If we don't judge, that's, that's Jesus' job. That's God's job. But in doing that, we also have to be wise enough to know when to walk away. There are times when you will have to walk away and say, this is not the time or the place. Maybe later on that person will listen. Maybe the circumstances will change in their life and they'll listen. Maybe it's somebody else. It doesn't need to be me. Maybe somebody else needs to be speaking to them because they'll get through. That can happen. Don't condemn yourself over that. Jesus said, keep going. Go to the next one. Be the, be the person that you need to be for the person that needs to hear. We are also called to be blameless. This is that dub part. And this is a challenge for us as well. The discernment is a challenge, but so is the blameless part. Philippians 2, 4 through 6 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I, lo I love this analogy here, shine like stars in the sky. Why do, sh why do stars shine? Because they're in darkness. If you ever go to a city and look up, you won't see them. There's so much light pollution, pollution around them, the stars are not even visible. The darker it is, the more they shine. And we want to shine like stars. We have to be different than the darkness. We need to be bright. We need to stand out. And to do that, we have to be blameless. Okay? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect world. will. So, we're meant to be blameless and to be separate. From the world to be separate from the darkness you will not shine if you are intentionally concealing yourself in the darkness we're supposed to be in the world but not of it we shine because we're different that's where we need to be as doves and that is something that is focused on us that's the interesting thing about these two dichotomies between snakes and doves the dove part is an inner part. That's your relationship with Christ and who you are inside. The serpent part is the intellectual part. That's the part where you make decisions based on the knowledge you know about Christ and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. But to be blameless, that's an internal thing. That's something we have to work on internally. Now, this, this passage here um, talks about let your love abound. Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says, Let your love abound. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. Approve here would be prove. It could also be replaced with prove. So you may prove what's excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Well, Philippians, uh, we all know, was written by Paul. Paul was one of those men, to, men who was a wolf, and he became a lamb to the slaughter. He was martyred in the end. He started out as a wolf. When he came to Christ, the wolf part of him disappeared. He was aggressive. He was nasty. He was chasing after Christians to have them put to death. All of those things, were, that was who Paul was. He was a wolf. After coming to Christ, that changed. Some of the greatest evangelists you'll ever see started out their lives as wolves. And God grabbed a hold of them and changed things around, turned, their, turned the direction around. Paul throughout his life used his discernment as well. He was blameless. You see that in many of his letters. He'll say, tell me what, I do, what I'm doing wrong. He's talking to churches saying, your, your accusations are false against me. But he also says to be wise himself. Paul used Roman law and his Roman citizenship as a way of defending the word of God. In the end, it took him to Rome, and he was able to actually preach to the leaders. He was also martyred in Rome. But Paul picked up on this differences between 
the serpent and the dove early on and kept it all throughout his life. So as believers, as followers, we're called to do the same thing. And it says, my prayer is that your love may abide, abound more and more. In other words, your love would increase more and more and more. That's what Paul is saying here. As Christians, we should be growing in our love. Growing in our love comes from the way we act, the way we believe, and the way we live. That's the dove portion. But that's not the end of the sentence. There's no period at the end of that. There's a comma. And that comma goes from abounding love, and then it says with knowledge and all discernment. There's the second half of it. Yes, love. But also grow in knowledge. And through your knowledge, grow in your discernment. So you can separate the good from the bad, the evil from the, the holy. So we can look at the world and see things the way it is and the way it should be and not surrender ourselves to the world. So we can be separate. And that is where it becomes so apparent that what Jesus was talking about here, when he talked about being wise as servants, we have to have that discernment. If we walk out there with the innocence of a child, that's wonderful, that's our faith. But if we walk into the wolves' den with the innocence of a child, the wolves aren't going to care. We still have to be wise about what we do and the way we do it. That can be a challenge. It can be a real challenge to us sometimes to look at things and understand this concept. And to look at the fact that we think we're witnessing, but no one's listening. If you watch the news, how many times do you see people, protesters, they don't want to discuss anything, do they? They're screaming and yelling and graffiti and firebombing and doing all these kind of things. With the Roe v. Wade decision that came out, we've had horrible things happen. And if you see the images or the, the videos on the news and you see the things that are going on, nobody there wants to talk about it. They're just screaming. We've seen this in the riots of the last few years. Same thing. Nobody wants to discuss what's going on. Nobody wants to sit down with a cup of coffee and say, hey, let's talk about this. You have one opinion, i got a different opinion. Let's talk about it. Nobody's saying that. And that's one of the greatest problems in our world today. Same thing's happening in politics. Nobody's talking about anything. They're just standing there pointing fingers at each other. And we know that's wrong. And we know that's not the way it's supposed to be. And we know that's not the way it was originally written by our founding fathers. And it certainly is the way it was written by our fathers. We are meant to have that gentle discussion with people. If we confront someone who's wrong, what does the Bible say about confronting someone within the church who's wrong? You just go to them in a pair and discuss it with your brother. If that doesn't work, you go a little bit different. You go a little bit different. Eventually, you've got to shut them off. That's the discernment. Eventually, if nothing's changing, but you start as gentle as you can possibly be. That's the, way we can, that's the way we live in this world, and that's the way we need to confront this world. Don't join in and become wolves. But don't join in and just become sacrificial lambs either. We can do so much more with our discernment. The time will come uh, later on this year where we will vote. There's an election this year. We're going to be voting on things. Discernment is necessary. You might be a Democrat. Don't you have to raise your hand. I know that's going to be dangerous in here. You might be a Republican, but that doesn't mean just because it says Republican that that's a person you should be supporting. Discernment. Are they following God's word? Are they honoring God? Are they living the life they should be living? All of those things are part of our life and the life that we should be leading as Christians. That is who we should be. That is who, that is who God's asking us to be. So let's pray. Let's pray about this. Father, in, in your word here, you, you tell us to be wise and to be innocent. To be gentle and to have discernment. To know when to walk away and know when to lay things down in front of you. Lord, you say, don't throw your pearls before swine. We're not to judge anyone, but we are to discern whether or not the message is being received that we're trying to deliver. Lord, I thank you so much for your grace, Lord, that in my life, 
you kept going and kept approaching me and kept touching my life until I hurt you. And I know that you're doing that in everyone's life. You keep touching and trying and pushing. And I know, Lord, that you have given us your power, that you have given us your guidance, and you have given us the job. We have been assigned the duty and the mission of going out and spreading your word in the world. But, Lord, we need discernment as well. We need guidance from the Holy Spirit. We need help figuring out exactly how to talk and when to talk and when, Lord, to walk away. We don't want anyone to perish, and neither do you. But, Lord, within the, the abilities that we have, Lord, we need to use the discernment that we have to do all that we can to be successful in this mission that you've given us, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray that through your word, through the Spirit, Lord, we can discern exactly what you want us, each and every one of us, to do and to be in this world. Help us to be bold and help us to be blameless. Help us to be strong and help us to be wise. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.